Good evening, everybody. We're just getting everybody loaded on here. So we'll give it a few minutes before we start into this. Thanks for joining us tonight. You're just joining us. We're still giving a getting some more attendees to log on to here, so we'll give it a couple more minutes. Thank you. All right, thank you all for joining us tonight. I, I see we still have some more uh, participants logging on here. It looks like we're kind of slowing down a little bit. We'll, we'll go ahead and, and get started here. So good evening and thank you for joining us for the first education session on the topic of wolf reintroduction and management that's hosted by the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. My name is Eric O'Dell and I'm a species conservation program manager with the agency. So as you likely know, Colorado voters passed Proposition 114 in November of 2020. And this requires the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission to take the steps necessary to begin the reintroductions of gray wolves by the end of 2023. And we've assembled a series of webinars to provide basically a foundation of, of information and knowledge and vocabulary for both our Parks and Wildlife Commissioners themselves as well as the general public. And we're really glad that you're all able to join us tonight. So I'm the host for tonight's session and, and Drs. Diane Boyd and, and John Horn join me. And in a moment, each of these invited speakers are going to share some of their experiences and knowledge uh, that they've gained over their years of working for state wildlife agencies, managing both wolves and their prey populations. And so first, a couple of housekeeping tips. Um, we're recording this webinar, as you know, and, and it will be posted on the Colorado Parks and Wildlife website as soon as it is available. But, the website, the link that you see on the bottom of this introduction slide is, is the good place to, to look. This is our Stay Informed, Wolves Stay Informed page. So that is where uh, information will be communicated there. So each presenter is gonna have about 40 minutes to give their presentations. And, and considering that we had nearly a thousand people register for this webinar, there's just no way that we're gonna be able to address all the questions that come in from the general public. And so we encourage you, if you do have questions about uh, the process or the, the presentation that's given today, to please submit those using the email address that's at the bottom of this slide. It's wolfcomments, W-O-L-F-C-O-M-M-E-N-T-S at state.co.us. And you can find this address at the bottom of the CPW Wolf Management webpage as well. And we'll use the questions that we receive uh, throughout this to update our Wolf FAQ document that's, that's on that webpage as well. Uh, we are going to take some questions from the members of the Parks and Wildlife Commission at the conclusion of the second presentation. So we're going to go through both presentations and then we'll uh, reconvene and, and uh, I'll moderate some questions to them. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Diane Boyd. Dr. Diane Boyd has four decades of applied expertise on the behavior, conservation and management of wild wolf populations. She began her career in 1977 with Dr. Dave Meech's Wolf Research Project in Minnesota, and she moved to Montana in 1979 to study gray wolf recovery in the Rocky Mountains from the first natural colonizer to approximately 2,000 wolves today in the Western United States. So her work has focused on wolf ecology, dispersal, habitat use, prey selection, behavior, morphology, genetic relationships, and the social dimensions of the human wolf conflict resolution. She's collaborated on research in the Rocky Mountains of the United States, British Columbia, Alberta, the Mexican Wolf Recovery Program and Wolf Research Projects in Italy and Romania. She's published numerous articles in scientific journals 
invited book chapters and articles in popular literature. She received her master's degree and her PhD from the University of Montana and is presently an affiliate faculty member at the University of Montana. Diane recently retired from Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks as the Region 1 Wolf and Carnivore Specialist, but she's continuing her wolf conservation efforts on a broader scale. So with that, thank you for uh, being able to, to present to us today, Diane, and it's all you now. So we can take this slide down and let Diane share hers. Thank you. Thank you. And oops, sorry, let me there. Uh, oops. Okay, that should be rolling. It's not doing it. Okay. Uh, on my share screen, I don't have a slideshow. Um, Kirk, can you go ahead and pop it up on your side, please? And Diane, give us one moment, and Kirk's going to present the, your slideshow okay. for you. There we go. That's better. Um, so I'm going to try. I'm going to try turning it from this, and if I can't, I'll just say next, please. So first, I want to thank everybody for attending. It's a huge full house. Um, can every, can you see the screen? Okay, Eric. Yes, that looks great, Diane. Thank you. Great. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight about 40 years of wolf recovery in Montana and the West. Most of my work has been in Montana, but of course, as wolves have spread everywhere, we've expanded further into the West. Next, please. Tonight, I'm going to talk, first of all, a brief review of the Rocky Mount wolf recovery and how the different states manage it, what it means to manage wolves costs and funding sources, which have been pretty creative for various states, uh, management status classifications, monitoring wolves and prey species. And I'm gonna finish up with a little bit about potential impacts to big game species. And then uh, John will talk at length about that. Next, please. A little bit a basic wolf ecology. One of the reasons that uh, wolves are so successful at recovering. I, I can't think of a more successful recovery story for any endangered species in the uh, United States is that they're very flexible. They're a social carnivore. So they have a lot of uh, pack members helping raise the pups. They're terrific dispersers. And that was an important part of my, my work that I did over the years. Um, they're territorial. They have a very high fecundity, which means they reproduce at a high rate. They're incredibly adaptable and they're habitat generalists. So they can live anywhere from the Arctic to the temperate forest. And so wolves will make it wherever we tolerate them. Next. As you know, a little brief, quick history. By the 1930s, basically the wolves were killed off from 98% of the range in the US and in the Mexico. Um, the Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973, which granted them endangered species status. And Bob Ream started looking up wolf reports throughout Montana and he developed the Wolf Ecology Project, which is where I came on. I did a lot of my wolf work as an employee and a grad student at the University of Montana. Next. So in 1979, we trapped and collared this wolf. This is the actual first wolf that came into the United States in the Western United States in 1979. And we named her Kishnina after a creek that was up in that corner of Glacier National Park. Next. We followed her alone for a couple of years and then she was joined by a three-toed black male. Apparently he had been in a trap at some point in his life. And as, as wolves will go, they became a pair and they eventually bred and, and began the first uh, recolonization of the Western United States in the very Northwest corner of Montana. Next. So they had their first litter in 1982. And we don't know what happened to Kishnina. She disappeared or was killed, but those pups all survived. And then a new female came in and she had the next litter in 1985. So an important point that I like to stress to people is that wolf recolonization occurred in Northwest Montana via dispersal from Canada. The wolves walked down from Canada and nobody brought them here. It was all through natural dispersals. Next. 
This is an actual picture of the den, the very first den in the Western United States in 50 years. I took this photo in Glacier National Park and where they den, the park was ecstatic to have them back. Next. This is a picture of the magic pack, which is what we named the very first colonizing pack because it was sort of magic that they appeared in the first place and even more magic that they survived. It was 11 wolves in that picture. Um, the wolves did very well. Most of the wolves in the early days were blacks, interestingly, and now it's about half and half. Next. So I've gone from one wolf in Montana to there's about 2,400 wolves in all of the Western states now, which are uh, connected to tens of thousands of wolves in Canada. It's one big meta population now, with the exception of the Mexican wolves, which are a different thing altogether, which we aren't going to cover tonight. This is a very current status map of wolves as in North America as of last year. Next. So some of the stuff we did, we it was pretty primitive technology back then. This is a picture of myself and my colleague Mike Fairchild in 1986 drawing blood on a wolf pup. That is a pup in Montana, they grow fast and they grow big. And we did sort of the typical field stuff. We looked at everything we could gather up by following them on skis, picking up scats, looking through an airplane and trying to do our best to figure out how they made their living and what makes for successful wolf recovery. Next. So back in those days, it was pretty simple. Think about the eighties, there was no GPS, no cell phones, there were no trail cameras, no spot devices. DNA really wasn't being used at all. We didn't even have laptops. We didn't have electricity. So, oops, excuse me. Sorry. So anyway, I was up in this airplane and we were tracking one of our dispersed wolves. She'd gone way north from Canada someplace. So we're flying very, very high over the Rocky Mountains. I didn't know if it was in British Columbia, Alberta. Just kept flying north and eventually we got some faint signals and was so excited. I had no idea where we were. I had paper maps on my lap. We didn't have any kind of a tracking device in the airplane for uh, locations. And eventually we got over the beep and we circled down and down and down and down. And there was my female wolf and she was surrounded with four other wolves. It was breeding season. She was obviously in the delight of the heart of the male they were courting and we were really pumped. So now we got a brand new pack in somewhere in Canada. We had no idea where we were. So I turned to my pilot, his best bush pilot in the world, Dave Horner, and he said, Dave, where are we? And he said, I'll fly and you read. And with that, he took off an airplane and he had spotted a highway that was closed and snowed over. And so he went up over this highway and then he dropped down in the plane and the skis just barely cleared the lanes that were snowed over. And I was writing down the exit signs on the highway so I could figure out where we were. And when we got back, I went about some paper maps and we were almost up to Banff. So that was kind of the good old days of, of radio tracking. Next. So the, the survey evolution uh, has happened a lot. Survey techniques have gone from lots of hands-on to some pretty amazing remote and uh, techniques that I'll talk about a little later and some great modeling efforts as well. Next. One of the more amazing dispersals that we documented was this little female wolf. She weighed about 80 pounds. Her number was 8551. Caught her in 1985 the first time. And in 1987, she disappeared. And she was shot. She disappeared in December. And she was shot uh, seven months later in July. I'll use my cursor here. And she was caught her right here in the northern west corner of Glacier National Park. She dispersed 550 miles straight north in seven months time. And what these circles of, of uh, orange are here is the Hinton and Fort St. John's areas, which are the two areas from which wolves were captured that were reintroduced into central Idaho and Yellowstone. So this little wolf told us that it was one continuous wolf population from Glacier Park all the way up through where these wolves were originally captured for introductions. They're not foreign. 150 pound Canadian wolves, they're all the same population. Next, please. And if she would have gone south instead of going north, she'd be about 100 miles south of Yellowstone Park. And we, we had hopes that they would make it there. But as you know, the story unfolded differently. Next. So what people don't know is that prior to the reintroductions into Yellowstone National Park in central Idaho in 1995 and 96, the Montana wolf population was building up as wolves trickled down from Canada. And we had at least 70 wolves uh, prior to the reintroductions. Next. 
And some of the interesting things about the wolf man management in Montana is those wolves, the very first one was in 79. And by 2002, the recovery goals had been met, which means we had uh, 150 wolves, 15 breeding pairs. We submitted our recovery plan to the Fish and Wildlife Service. And the most important point here, which I've highlighted, is that wolves were delisted in 2000. In 11 completely in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, and in 2017 in, in Wyoming. So, so a few interesting things is the hunting seasons, trapping seasons opened. Our program is funded a lot by the sale of hunting licenses. Pittman Robertson dollars is about $400,000 a year through the sale of licenses. There's 20,000 wolf licenses sold annually. Um, the USDA does all of the depredation work. We as a state agency don't do it. There's about $65,000 to $85,000 paid out in compensation every year for um, livestock depredation. And the interesting one is the last bullet that there is actually a law on the books in the Montana uh, legislature passed a law that requires fish, wildlife and parks to radio collar every pack that might come in contact with livestock, which is, imp is impossible because wolves live remotely. They're smart, they're hard to catch and they're scattered all over. But we try to keep track of them. Next. So the challenges come from both the ranching uh, livestock producers and the hunting communities. And they're both equally important. We have to work with everybody and they both have vested interests because they are perceived the wolves um, are impacting, negatively impacting their livelihood or their passion or their recreation. Next. This graph, you don't have to get too technical about it, but the groups of bars here, you will see, um, this is after legal harvest. So this is a graph from 2005 to 2019. The majority of wolf mortalities were through legal harvest. The second biggest cause of mortality was through agency control, which would be wildlife services. The next little group down here is uh, the 10J rule, um, shoot on site, private landowners defending their livestock. This little group here is cars getting hit by wolves and trains. Yes, that does happen. Um, there's a factor of illegal mortality and then there's a smaller group that involves um, natural mortalities. And this is not an unbiased sample because these wolves are brought to us to be checked in. So um, we see more wolves dead from human causes because people bring them to us. But even in the early days when I was studying wolves, when they were fully protected and they weren't was not hunting season on them, we still found that 85% of wolf mortalities were caused by humans, even when they were fully endangered. Next. This is a little rundown for you from our first year when we first, I'm sorry, they were delisted in 2009. When we first had uh, wolf hunting seasons up through present, um, we, we were actually counting wolves in the early years and getting minimum counts on how many wolves there were. And then in 2000 and about 2019, we did what's called the POM, the Patch Occupancy Model, which is a modeling effort based on hunter surveys. We call up hunters that have hunted deer and elk and ask how many wolves they've seen, where they've seen them and so forth. And there's a lot of assumptions built into the model and we're not gonna go into the model because we don't have time. But we began using the POM as the means to count wolves. And what was interesting is wolf numbers peaked right about here, 2012, 2013, and estimates slightly declined and then sort of stabilized. So while wolf populations remain the same, the percent of the population that was being killed through either just harvest or harvest uncontrolled together keeps going up. I find that interesting. Um, it's a pretty significant portion of the population that is being taken out and yet wolf numbers seem to have stabilized. Next. One of the questions that I've always wondered, well, if we're shooting and killing and, and removing 40% of the population, how does the population remain relatively stable at such a high level of harvest? Our field data shows that as a result of the disruption of the packs from harvest and livestock depredation removals, packs splinter up. So we're used to have one pack having one big area and one breeding female. Now you might have two packs in the same area, you have two breeding females, so you have smaller packs, you have smaller home ranges, there's more females reproducing, and then there's increased dispersal and mate choices because of the, the disturbance in the, uh, 
in the social structure amongst the wolves. Next. And with that realization that the assumption of the model had a certain amount of territory per wolf pack and a certain pack size, and we were documenting that, that home ranges, the territories were getting smaller and pack sizes were getting smaller, they redeveloped the POM model and recalculated everything. And then it increased the total wolf number by about 25%. And they went back through the years and redid all that. But I'm just saying it's difficult to count wolves. And when you in Colorado have wolves more than a handful, you're gonna run into the same, uh, same kettle of fish here. Next. So then of course, there was the um, reintroduction to Yellowstone in Idaho. Um, and the Northwest Montana recovery area, they were fully endangered and everywhere else they were non-essential experimental, but now that's all gone away and they're all blended. Next. So the wolves are reintroduced, 35 into Idaho and 31 into Yellowstone, and the rest is history. They, it, you got to think about this, wolves had never been reintroduced anywhere and different methods were used and both worked really well and the wolves reproduced and recolonized much more quickly than was ever anticipated. And they basically are all connected into one big population now with here and spreading into Oregon, Colorado and so forth. Next. So I just put this little map up there. It's old data now, it's already 13 years old, but just to give you an idea, this is dispersals of almost 300 radio colored wolves in a 15 year period. They went to two countries, seven states and two provinces from our core populations. And that's the lesson you need to know about wolves is to go 500 miles is, is not unusual. It, it's not real common, but to go 200, 300 miles, they, they live by their feet as the old Russian proverb says, and you will have wolves going everywhere and they will show up in places you aren't expecting them. Next. So we're talking a little bit here. I made a table of the most current data I could find and how different states manage their populations of wolves. So I'm not gonna go over line by line because you can look at it yourself. And if anybody has more information when I'm done, my email will be at the bottom, you can write me. Um, it, it's interesting because if you look at when the years when the wolves started showing up, Montana was first in 79, and then in Idaho and Wyoming, they were introduced. And then they've been trickling into Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado. The numbers increase very quickly. Um, and in Washington state, the, the Fish and Wildlife Department of Fish and Wildlife manages it jointly with the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Indian Reservation. So there's two entities in that state managing wolves. Different kinds of harvest and lethal control used. Every state just about has a different name on how they classify their wolves. And this cost that I have over here, I just want to point out that it's an asterisk because some states like the state of Wyoming and Montana, basically the cost includes the salaries of all the biologists, the gas, the truck, the helicopter time, the, the, the wildlife services lethal control money spent, the non-lethal control, aversive conditioning. It includes kind of everything. And then you go down to the other states like California and it's basically just the salary of the biologist and the, the smaller project and they don't have many wolves. So, this is very much ballpark. It's sort of minimum and maximum, but just I want you to be thinking about when your wolves come to Colorado, you're going to be probably looking at a million dollars pretty easily to have a program once it gets wolves start carrying on to manage them. It, it's uh, not inexpensive. Next. So what does it mean to manage wolves? The first thing, as I've said, is to expect the unexpected. You have to be flexible. If you think wolves are going to stay on the western side of the state, they're going to show up 300 miles out on the prairies on the eastern side. It's going to happen. You know, wolves that go where there isn't habitat or there have conflicts aren't going to be surviving. It's sort of a problem. It's kind of, we found that in Montana, wolves show up way over on the North Dakota border and those wolves are show up because they're dead. They don't, they aren't able to set up and establish a population in those areas because they're get into trouble. They're too visible to, but over in the forested areas and the private, large private ranches and federal and state lands, they do quite well. The biggest thing is collaboration. It involves everybody working together. It involves people sitting at the table who normally don't talk to each other. They're normally at fisticuffs over issues. 
drop that. You have to get together and talk because you're going to have to work together to, to uh, create a wolf program that's going to work. Outreach and public inclusion is absolutely essential. Um, states and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have a partnership going. And when wolves are first recovering, the Fish and Wildlife Service the feds have a, a more involved role in it. Um, up in my part of Montana, we have more hunting interests than we do ranching in this part of the state. Other parts of the state, there's more ranching interests than, than there are hunter conflicts. But up here, most of the conflicts we hear about are from the hunting community. And I have worked with the ranchers up here and set up some range rider programs that have gone very well. And like I said, we have different partners at the tables who don't normally talk to each other and they're all working together because the ranchers don't want cow kill, cows killed and the wolf conservationists don't want the wolves killed. So the, the goal is kind of the same, keep them both on the landscape in a way that works. Um, so one of the other things is livestock depredation is going to happen. It's just going to happen. So before you have wolves come in, you need to have control guidelines, compensation programs set up, range riders, has to be in place. Public conflicts are going to arise of the arguments about if we're going to use lethal versus non-lethal control. And I've, I've, I've done a lot of both, and I'm not going to have time to talk about it tonight. But you're going to have to deal with those issues as well. The livestock producer conflicts, I find that the most of the ranchers I worked with are very reasonable. Um, they, it's a big threat to some of them, and some of them have a lot of problems, some of them don't have any problems, but you gotta work with them. And the fact of the matter is, these large ranches have some of the best wildlife habitat in our states. They have the wintering ranges for the elk and the deer and the moose, and that's where the wolves are gonna end up being on the wintering range. So, you want to have them as, as allies, not as enemies. Monitoring and management protocols have to be in place. And there's many, many tools which we can use to manage and monitor wolves nowadays. It's really, it's really amazing the technology we're using with GPS collars and DNA tracking. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to get research projects going and develop university uh, partnerships. Uh, Yellowstone is a classic example. There has been so much amazing research coming out of there and the whole trophic cascade arguments and all that. And I always found it interesting that Glacier Park does not have that same interest. There's very little um, research going on on wolves at all. And there's no university projects essentially going on. So it's just, doesn't, it's not the flagship park, I guess, that Yellowstone and his wolves aren't as visible in Glacier either. Funding. We're going to talk a little bit more about funding later, but funding is a big question and there's many ways uh, to go about gaining funding. Most importantly is take several deep breaths. Wolves are not, are not the panacea to save all of the, the trees and the elk and they're not the devil that's going to kill all the game either. They're just a wild animal out there and the sooner that people get used to thinking about them as like a, a, a deer, an elk, a mountain lion, a bear, the better off everybody's going to be for having them around. Next. So I've been researching a little bit all the different ways that the different states have funded their wolf programs. So we've I've got lottery ticket proceeds, a wolf stamp was proposed, the sale of wolf hunting licenses is a big, big one here. Uh, state general funds oftentimes can have ways to work with the game, game agencies. Pittman Robertson funds are great. They're tax on ammo and hunting equipment, and we, we depend on that a lot. Fish and Wildlife Service chips in. Uh, proposed bed tax on uh, different uh, hotels, lodging to help pay for the tourist aspect of having wolves. Wildlife Services chips in. State Department of Livestock, our Livestock Loss Board, pays the compensation for a lot of these uh, depredations. Nonprofits are a huge, huge help for partnering non-game tax checkoff, and personalized license plates. All of these things have been used. Next. Management classification options. So in the different states that I've looked at, I'm starting at the top, the endangered species is the most protected on on down to the predator status, which is where they are in parts of Wyoming and going to be, if not already are, in parts of Idaho. 
So in Montana here, we're a species in need of special management. It's the only animal in the state of Montana that has that classification. But Colorado, you'll, you'll have a lot of opportunity to think about if you want them to have them as a trophy animal, endangered species, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll have an option. Next. So monitoring wolves and prey populations. I wished I'd had all the tools back 30 years ago when I was doing my field work that we have available now. Most importantly, you need to have a really good study design to produce unbiased research. And sound science is the best way to make decisions and including the social dimensions. But science and social sometimes are kind of like parallel universes. Um, GPS collars are amazing. I have really enjoyed being able to put out GPS collars and see where these wolves are every so many times a day without having to leave it, not having to ride, drive around with a truck. Uh, modeling to count wolves, patch occupancy model. DNA can be collected from scats, hair, many ways of using DNA to monitor wolf populations. Um, I love camera trapping, it's my favorite tool. Uh, drones are becoming more popular and we've got some people using drones here to, to count wolves at rendezvous sites and stuff. Telemetry, there's many non-invasive methods. Um, Dave Osband's done some amazing work in Idaho. And then, of course, there's citizen science and public reports. That's how sort of kind of a good way to, to keep the, 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 your thumb on where wolves are being seen at. Next. So potential impacts to big game species. And John's going to talk a lot about this. So I'm just going to touch on some of the work that we've, we've done here in Montana. Wolves can have impacts on big game species, as can mountain lions, grizzly bears, humans, cars winters, climate change, all these things can have potential impacts. But I'm just going to talk about what our science says. Next. This is kind of where I said science and social are sometimes parallel universes. So I found, you know, and, and, and people want to know what reality is. And so it's our job as biologists and managers to distill information in a, in a way that people can use it and, uh, in, and uh, understand and get feedback and listen to what people say. Next. So from we did a multi-multi-year elk study down in the Bitterroot and the Clark Fork. And what I found really interesting, it was just published. All this data that I put up here was just published in 2020. You can look it up on our website. Interestingly, they found that when they killed more mountain lions, the elk herd increased. Uh, both calf recruitment and the adult population. They also found that having more aggressive harvest regulations on black bear and wolves did not influence elk calf survival or recruitment. And I have to tell you, I was kind of surprised by that. I figured that wolves would have a, a huge impact or a significant portion, but as it turns out, the rates of wolf predation on marked calves remain low throughout all the years, despite variation in harvest regulations realized wolf harvest, and then wolf counts. Basically, malt lions were driving the elk population survival in that study. Next. The other new study that was just put up on our website, they did a seven-year moose study in three different regions in Montana, and they were looking, actually looking at some other things about habitat use and this and that, but they found out in the seven years, they had 71 collared adult female moose die and we can hunt female moose here in the state they're not just bulls but it was really interesting so this dark sliver here dark green is predation by bears the this sliver is predation by lions this sliver is predation by wolves this is animals that died from infection from wounds from an unknown predator humans this is uh humans killed this whole pie shape some were illegal and legal one was a vehicle collision Interestingly, the majority, like 60% of the moose died from health related reasons that were not related to predators or hunting. Now, you know, I'm, people don't think about that. What are health related reasons? Well, one big thing is since climate change has come on, winters don't get so cold anymore and the tick populations have been going crazy. And so the, the moose um, have a very, very severe in tick, uh, tick infestation and they lose their hair and they, they basically die of hypothermia. Um, they don't eat well, 
There's different things going on with fires that have affected their habitat, but the health related segment is by far the biggest cause of mortality. I just found that fascinating. It's available on our website, just published in 2020. You can look it up. Next. And then there was a, a mule deer study that was again going on multi-region, multi-years. And the take home message here, and you don't have to necessarily read all the stats, but you'll see under mountain lion, mountain lion predation was the leading cause of mule deer mortality. Again, I was kind of surprised. I thought at least wolves and mountain lion would be even Stephen. But the other thing is in our part of the Western part of the state, there are three times as many mountain lions as there are wolves. So there's three times as many sets of teeth and claws on cats as there are wolves that are killing these big game animals. Again, this was published in 2020. Next. So we can add up all this data. We can talk about mountain lions. We can talk about impacts of hunting, and I am a hunter. We've got grizzly bears and black bears. Uh, winter, by far and away, has biggest significant impact. And boom, just like one hard winter can really knock back a population. There's vehicle collisions. There's all kinds of things that kill our big animals. And I find when I have these conversations with hunters who are, you know, maybe not real fond of wolves, next, they still come back to, well, the wolves are killing all the deer and elk. So science and social beliefs don't always meet. That's the bottom line there, even with the, the documentation. And sometimes wolves do impact populations, but that's not what our data has been showing us. And, and John will have maybe other things to say. Next. The other issue then in Montana is livestock depredations. And these are confirmed livestock depredations. Um, on the bottom axis, it looks like it's 1990 up through 2019. So it's about 30 years of data and zero, zero animals to 225 at the top. Um, and these are confirmed, confirmed wolf depredations. So there may be calves that were killed, but there's no remains left to find. So there's nothing to confirm. So this is really a minimum amount of depredation because a lot of times you just don't find it. I have to just say that right out front. So you go along and the dotted line is the wolf population. Remember another graph where I said it kind of peaked up here over in this area. Um, but the number of wolves removed, that's the dotted line, was also peaking and drops off. And it was the, the Wildlife Service has hit the wolves pretty hard in 2009 and 10 because there was a lot of depredation. So the cattle is the black line. Sheep is the beige line. Sheep, they got a lot of sheep that one year. And as a result, because of the, in, the high levels of depredation, they killed a lot of wolves. And the number of wolves they had to kill then tapered off because they killed the depredating ones and the wolves in infield didn't have that as much of an issue. And the number of depredations tapered off as well. So it, and the, the, it's a belief that um, that aggressive control response was what re helped resolve some of the depredation issues. But wolves kill livestock occasionally. And, there's a million animals out on the range out here. And they, I'm amazed they don't kill more. I mean, if I was a wolf and I had a choice between killing an elk or a, a calf, a domestic cow, I, I'd be dead. I mean, I, that'd be so much easier to kill. I'm, I'm amazed it doesn't happen more often actually. Next. So now we get to Colorado. You guys are, it's a good, very exciting times. And then you got ahead between the wolves that are coming in on your own and the Proposition 14. 114. Next. So here's a list of some of the confirmed Colorado wolf sightings starting in 2004. Uh, these are confirmed by agency people. And so you can see the list. There have been quite a few wolves that have made it, that have been found uh, dead or on camera or have radio collars. And Probably in addition to those, there are a few more that weren't detected that are around. And then some reproduction occurred. Sounds like the first time a pack was confirmed had reproduced was in 2019 through DNA tests. Um, so they're, they're just kind of trickling down. And how many wolves can make it through the Wyoming gauntlet without being killed? It's a pretty small number. But, you know, gosh, back in Montana in 1979, we had one wolf as well. So they're trying to make it on their own. Next. 
And now we have Proposition 114 has come in. So the wolves will be reintroduced by the end of December of, I think it's 2023. So that's why we're having these conversations now is to think ahead, all these lessons learned from not just Montana, but the other Western states, what kind of things can Colorado be thinking about? Next. So some of the, I think kind of in summary, some of the wolf management issues for Colorado is you're going to, you've got natural dispersal going on and you're going to have reintroduction. And of course, you'll have to figure out where you're going to get the source wolves from and those populations will blend. There's no doubt about it. The livestock depredation issue is going to be very important. Again, ranchers provide a huge amount of wildlife habitat and wolves will live on ranches. They aren't just going to live in the parks. Um, so we'll have to have the control, a compensation program that's fair and some proactive prevention types of thing. There's flattery, there's aversive conditioning, there's range riders, there's wildlife services with lethal control. There's many different avenues to um, try and head off those kind of conflicts. And then there's the perceptions of impacts to big game hunting. Some are real and, and some are not. And that those questions are gonna be very important to the hunters and fish and game uh, park, excuse me, parks and wildlife in Colorado. Uh, maybe sometime in the future, you may have regulated wolf hunting. I think that's a ways out, but I tell you what, in 1979, when I came to Montana and there was one wolf in 1979, if you would have told me that we'd be legally harvesting 300 wolves a year in Montana in the year 2020, I would have said you out of your mind and here we are. So you just never know. Uh, monitoring your wolf population, there's you don't have to reinvent wheels anywhere there. It's, it's great. There's lots of great um, tools, collars, DNA cameras, things like that. Research, uh, outreach and education is, is absolutely critical. And to listen to the public. Obviously, that's what you're doing. That's why you're having these, these wolf seminars. Funding question, that's, that's a big one. And the most important one really is how do we create social tolerance? Because wolves historically have had the biggest range of any mammal globally, except for humans, over the world, the whole world of the surface of the earth, because they can live anywhere. It's just a matter of where will we tolerate them living. They're, they're not going to be living in, in Iowa anymore, but there's many places in Colorado where they, they just do quite well. Next. So how do we create social tolerance? The, the wolf watchers in Yellowstone versus the, the ranchers over by Billings. I mean, they, they, there's like, they don't see eye to eye on anything. Next. I feel that the way to create social tolerance is to create value in the wolves. And in many places now, because some of the homework wasn't done and, and people are butting heads more, wolves have zero value or a negative value. But if you look at it, reality, if you're, a, if you're a hotel owner or a restaurant owner in Gardner, Montana, they wolves have a huge economic value. Wolf watchers bring in approximately $35 million annually to that, to that economy around Yellowstone Park. That's huge. It's phenomenal. If you're, a, if you're a biologist, ecologically, they play a really important role in returning them and filling that niche again with a large canid carnivore has created a whole bunch of interesting spin-offs amongst the lions, the bears, the coyotes, the foxes, and on down the food chain. And then, of course, what happens to the ungulates? They're constantly, the populations are changing and shifting, and John's going to talk quite a bit about that. There's the aesthetic value. Maybe you live in New York City, and you will never in your life see a wolf, but it makes you feel really good to know that they are out there, and that right now, this week, every wolf in the western U.S. is if they're a breeding a pair, they got little pups in their den. I mean, it's kind of that value. If you're Native American, perhaps it is a cultural value to you to know that the wolf, spirit animal or whatever, is a very important animal to have out in the landscape. If you're an uh, academic, perhaps the knowledge you can gain and pass on to your students and the world is a really important value to you. Then there's a the recreational value, which is both consumptive and non-consumptive. But maybe, maybe a person wants to have a a most amazing wolf hunt ever and harvest a trophy animal that they had to call in, they really work at it. Maybe they, maybe you wanted to see them in Yellowstone and you don't believe any should be killed. 
What I'm saying is I'm not promoting that any of these values are right or wrong, but they are all of value. And therefore, all these different viewpoints value having wolves in the landscape. That's my point, not which are right and which are wrong. They're important to have value. Next. So where will wolves survive? Well, it's very interesting because we have an idea where they're gonna survive. When I first came to Montana, I thought, wow, they live in Glacier Park, that's really cool. Well, they ended up moving to the Nine Mile and they're out in the suburbs of Missoula and they crossed through the school grounds in Kalispell and the, the cops got them on their cop car camera. I mean, wolves will live wherever we tolerate it and they only need three things. They need adequate wild ungulate population and these are elk in the photo uh, in Gardner Valley. These are not cattle. They need large undeveloped landscape with refugia for having pups. And that does not mean wilderness. Wolves are not necessarily creatures of the wilderness. They just have to find an, a quiet enough place that they can den and have those pups survive to the fall. And they need freedom of persecution. So a lot of these places are gonna be private ranches. Some of them are gonna be some of our spectacular parks and forested lands. And some of them might just be a subdivision, like this wolf run subdivision. We actually had a wolf pack two years ago that den in a gated community halfway between Whitefish and Kalispell, which is like 15 miles, a gated community. And the people had video, video of the wolves playing in their driveway in the culvert by their mailbox. Well, inside of a gated community, nobody can not, nobody can shoot. There are large tracts of land with big houses with lots of forest, and there's tons of deer. It's like, well, I don't know that they're gonna have longevity, but they chose that as their place to live. That kind of stuff happens with wolves. They're, they always expect the unexpected. Next. And with that, I think I finished right on time. And I just wanna thank a lot of people. Here they are. There's my email address if you have questions. And uh, after John's talk, and I will sign off now. I guess I don't have to, un well, I can try and unshare my screen, but thank you very much. Thank you, Diane, that was, that was great. And yeah, you can go ahead and, and stop sharing, uh, and John, you can go ahead and, and start sharing your screen. Diana, that was a great presentation. Thank you very much. I love that story of flying in the airplane, looking at the road signs, trying to figure out where <laughs> that the things have changed since then, so. Thank you for sharing. We're going to jump right into John's presentation, um, get you up to a, a shared screen. And, and as he's getting that ready, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce him. So Dr. John Horn is a senior wildlife research biologist with Idaho Department of Fish and Game, a position that he's been in since 2013. His work with Idaho Fish and Game primarily focuses on developing and applying new approaches to better monitor Idaho's wildlife. He's also involved in several broad scale research projects aimed at developing a better understanding of how Idaho's big game species interact with one another in their habitat and how management actions might affect the system. John spent his early years, and I think big game in, in Idaho's definition, wolves are, are part of that big game. John spent his early years in the wilds of Alaska until he and his family moved to Texas in, in third grade. After graduating from high school in Texas, he went on to receive his Bachelor of Science from North Carolina State University and his master's degree from Texas A&M Kingsville, and then ultimately got his PhD from the University of Idaho. John has worked on a variety of species from golden cheek warblers in Texas. To Sonoran pronghorn in Arizona to caribou and polar bears in Alaska. He considers himself fortunate to have landed in a state with such an interesting and diverse array of wildlife to study. So John, thank you for joining us tonight and we'll hand it off to you. Okay, so thank you, Eric, for having me. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to talk with you about some of the things that I've worked on, here, been fortunate enough to work on here in Idaho um, for the past, so eight, year, eight years or so. Uh, it's a great place to do research, a lot of interesting questions, a lot of really cool wildlife. And so, yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity. I think this is a great idea. Um, this is not sort of the first time that wolves have come onto the scene. And so it's not like Idaho and Montana where it was like, what's gonna happen? We have no idea. Um, this is a little bit different. They've been here for about 16 years, established 
in Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana, longer in Montana, but we know a lot now. And hopefully some of the stuff that I can share with you this evening um, will give you just a little bit of information on how wolves can or cannot affect ungulate populations. So they're coming. It looks like with what Diane said, they're either going to come naturally or you guys may be trying to reintroduce some wolves into the state. So one of the big questions is, what effect is this gonna have on ungulate populations? Um, now wolves will eat a variety of prey species, but they really do like elk. And so that's, for the most part, what I'm gonna talk about uh, this evening is what effects potentially could wolves have on elk populations in the state? Just a general outline of the talk. Um, so you'll have some idea of where I'm going and, and, and what I've covered. I'm gonna go into a little bit of a background of elk in Idaho. And this is just really brief, just to sort of set up why we are doing the research that we are doing here in Idaho. That background provides the impetus for a statewide elk survival study uh, that I was the lead on, and I will talk about the results of that survival study. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about these things called predator pits. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of them. Uh, a lot of people have. I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I did do some research related to predator pits and um, elk and, and wolves. And then uh, lastly, I'm just going to follow up uh, with answering how are the wolves doing in Idaho. To do that elk survival study, I actually had to do a separate research project just to quantify uh, sort of the risk of, of wolf predation on elk. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the results uh, from that research effort. And I just want you to know all of those three things, the elk survival study, the research on predator pits, how are the wolves doing in Idaho? These are all published research projects. Um, and so in short, they're the best information that we have. Those studies have been peer reviewed. Uh, they're published in reputable journals. Um, and I'll cite the, I'll give you an example of those, or I'll show you those journals uh, whenever I talk about those separate studies. Um, I have a lot of ideas about how elk and wolves and ungulates relate. Uh, but for this talk, I'm gonna try to stick to the published studies, the research and what that research has shown. So before I get into those studies, I just wanted to sort of give you an idea of how, um, how things are going in Idaho. Uh, this is a plot of statewide elk harvest. Um, going way back to the early 1900s. I kind of just want you to focus on the right half of this um, plot. And then I'll show you where the wolves were reintroduced. They were, they were brought into Idaho in 1996. Uh, the shading is, is graduated. And that's, to, that's just to imply that just because wolves showed up in 1996, that doesn't mean that there were wolves in all parts of the state in 1996. It took them a while. It took them about 10 years uh, to colonize the entire state. And so all I wanted to show you here was that for the most part, uh, statewide elk harvest has remained relatively stable uh, since wolf reintroduction. But I also want to point out that elk in Idaho are not created equal. And this is something that you'll probably find out when you start to assimilate studies from Montana, from Idaho, if Washington starts to put out research on wolves. And then when they eventually come to Colorado, different places can have different experiences. And so I wanted to show this slide, and this is, um, how, the elk, how the elk are doing in the different elk management zones in Idaho. So we have about 20 elk management zones in Idaho. And this is a, this is a slide that shows how they're doing in relation to man, management objectives. 
So before wolves were established back in 1999, um, about a third of those management zones were actually above the management objectives. About 60% were within the management objectives, and then about 10% of them were below. So those were the populations, the elk zones, where we wanted more elk, but there weren't, but they were below those objectives. And so what happened? About 20 years, um, 20 years later, um, after wolves, well, those elk zones that were within the management objectives sort of got dispersed out. Now we have about 40% that are actually above management objectives. So there's more elk in these zones than the managers would like to have. And this is a lot of times due to like agriculture depredations by elk on crops. Um, but you also notice that the number of management zones that are below objectives has increased. And this is where a lot of the research and the concern about wolf depredation or predation on, on ungulates comes into play. A lot of these zones that are below management objectives are in the backcountry of out Idaho. And this is some of the places that, pe that's what Idaho is sort of famous for, these backcountry elk hunts. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about those backcountry um, places in Idaho um, and give you a little bit of history of, because it's kind of a cool story of how the elk have fared in those areas. So the area I'm going to talk about right now, we call it the low, low zone. It's in north central Idaho. It's comprised of the Nez Perce and Clearwater National Forests, and it's really kind of a cool area uh, historically. This is where Lewis and Clark and their expedition came over and after having lots of, lots of game to, to hunt and eat on their way in Montana and, um, and in the plains, they came over into Idaho and really couldn't find anything. Uh, so they christened a creek and they called it Hungry Creek because they famously about starved to death. Um, so we don't really know what the elk populations were like in that part of Idaho back in the early 1800s, but from all accounts, there just weren't very many. And then some things happened. In the early 1900s, we had widespread wildfires in that area that really set back the seral stage. So you had a lot of new growth um, and new vegetation growing. The early 1900s was also the time when predator control, nationwide federal sponsored predator control was at the harvest. So wolves were pretty much extirpated, grizzly bears were gone, but also like black bears and mountain lions were at very low population abundances. So what did this mean for elk? Well, there was great habitat due to those fires. There was very low predation. This was also the time when game laws were enacted, so they were protected. This is basically a Shangri-La for elk, and so the population really exploded in this part of, of Idaho. What did this mean for hunters and the public in general? They're happy, happy, happy. Everybody likes elk, um, and they were all over the place. And since things started to change in about the mid-1980s, uh, that population in the low, low zone started to decline. Some of that was due to cow harvest. We actually thought there were too many elk out there. Um, and so there was a cow harvest. Then there was a record setting winter um, that the population kind of crashed. They halted all cow harvest. Wolves became established shortly after that. And then instead of this population sort of rebounding, it has just continued to decline. And so this is sort of the impetus for some of the concern. Um, was it wolves? Was it the winter and just bad winters coming on? Was it bad habitat? So that's sort of the impetus for the elk survival study that I'm about to talk about. And our research questions, what are the main drivers of elk mortality? Is it predation? Is it wolves that are really driving these things? Is it habitat? 
Is it the loss of early seral, um, good, lush habitat? Or is it winter severity? So these were the three main things that we wanted to ask. Um, and the way we did that, we took an, we had an elk survival study that was 12 years. Uh, the results of this are published in the Journal of Wildlife Management. Um, you can take a look at that. And I'll just go through some of the highlights of that study. So how are we gonna answer these questions? Well, we decided to, we had to go big or go home. And what I, what I mean by that is we took all of our GPS collar data. So this is like 1,200 cow elk that had been collared, 800 six month old calves, and approximately 200 wolves that had GPS collars. So we could monitor these things, we could see where they went, where they, uh, what they died of, and so forth. And we did this across the entire state. And so we had 29 elk populations and we looked at this data across 12 years. So it, as, as far as scale goes, this really is a very large scale elk survival study. And for each collared elk, we looked at what was the local pack size that that elk was exposed to throughout the time that it was being monitored? What was the mean snow depth that it was exposed to? And if it was a calf, how big was it? And then we tried to relate those, those different variables to their risk of dying. So what did we find? I'm gonna go through a few slides like this one. Um, this shows the risk of dying. So on the y-axis, there's the weekly mortality rate. This is how likely you are to die. And on the x-axis is time. So January through the end of, of the year. And so you'll notice the highest risk of tying for calves overall is about the beginning of March. Now this first variable that I'm gonna look at is snow depth. So what does snow depth, what, what does it matter? Does it matter to your risk of dying? So when it's a low snow year, so if that particular winter just didn't snow very much, there's a 36% chance that a calf is gonna die that year. There's not a lot of difference between a low snow year and an average snow year. But if you get really deep snows, that risk of dying that year increases to 50%. So there's a 14% increase in your risk of dying if you're in a low snow year versus a really deep snow year. So we can look at that same thing for the effect of pack size. So how big were the wolf packs in the area where that calf was living? If you're living in an area where the pack sizes aren't very big, like three, uh, you have a 28% chance of dying that year. If you live in an area where there are larger packs, up to nine, that increases up to 47%. So there's a 19% increase in the risk of dying when you go from an area where the packs are really small, I wouldn't even, I don't know if you'd even call it a pack, um, up to larger pack sizes, like nine individuals. And then the last thing is the effect of calf size. So does it matter how big you are going into the winter. So if you're a large calf, you have about an 18% chance of dying that year. If you're a small calf, you have about 66% chance of dying. It's an increase of 48%. So the effect of calf size, just how big you are, is a really strong predictor of whether or not you're going to die that year. So to summarize for these calf mortality studies, in general, about 60% of them survived from six months old to one and a half years. The risk of calf mortality was influenced by, mostly by body size. It had the biggest effect. 
Um, but then also pack size and snow depth had an influence on whether or not you were going to die. We also looked at cause specific mortality of these calves and predation was the major cause of mortality. It was basically equal between mountain lion and wolves. And this is statewide. There's a lot of variation within each region. So, but statewide, it was about equal between mountain lions and wolves. So the next question we were able to ask is, well, which calves are dying? They're gonna die from mountain lions and wolves. Are the wolves and mountain lions preferentially selecting a certain type of calf? And in this case, we looked at size. And on the right, you can see a plot. Um, on the y-axis is this preference ratio. And that says, are they, are they killing more of that size category than was available? So are they like preferentially selecting for some size category? If it's above one, that means they were preferring that category. If it's below one, that means they didn't like it at all. They, were, they didn't um, select that category. So wolves preferred to take smaller calves. Uh, the preference ratio was greater than one, but for the most part, mountain lions didn't discriminate. So they just basically took anything that walked in front of them. So we can look at the same thing for cow mortality. I'm not gonna show you all the plots. I'll just give you sort of the summary table at the end. 91% of our cows survive annually. So that's a pretty high survival rate, um, but populations are very sensitive to cow survival rate. So a little bit of change in cow survival can mean a lot for population dynamics. The risk of cow mortality was influenced by wolf pack size. So similar to the calves, but in this case, it changed it by about 5% when you went from areas where there weren't very many, uh, where the pack sizes were relatively small, to the areas where pack sizes were relatively large. And then winter severity also had an influence on the risk of cows dying. Main causes of death, uh, there is cow harvest in much of the state. As I said previously, a lot of the elk management zones are above management objectives. And one of the ways to get those populations back down is through cow harvest. And so it's not surprising that harvest is one of the main causes of death for our colored cows. Um, but then after that, it was again, about equal mountain lions and wolves. So we'll look at the same thing we did with the calves. Are there particular cow segments that are dying and in particular to predation by wolves and mountain lions? In this case, we looked at age of the cows and wolves preferred to take the older cows. So there was some preference towards taking the cows that were sort of past their reproductive prime. Uh, whereas mountain lions, again, didn't discriminate. Walks in front of a mountain lion, it seems like it's fair game. Okay, so what did we learn from this study? Well, the one that really jumped out is small calves die. You're a small calf, you're not gonna do very well. And there's a couple of things that may go into that. Um, why would a calf be small uh, entering winter? Well, one is parturition date. So calves that are born later in the summer tend to be smaller going into winter. Where there's also research that shows the maternal, con the, the condition of the maternal cow can influence how big a calf is going into winter. And so this is an area for future research really kind of a cool result. Um, we don't really know why some cow calves are smaller than others at this point. Also pack size does influence both cow and calf survival. So what this means is that management of wolf populations, either to make the uh, wolf pack smaller or larger, uh, can influence both cow and calf survival. But also, as Diane mentioned earlier, we can't forget there are other predators out there. And it is pretty interesting where we showed those preference ratios, where the mountain lions tend to take just about anything that's out there, whereas you might argue that wolves 
And this has been shown in other studies, tend to select out um, either older cows or the smaller, potentially weaker calves in the population. Okay, I'm gonna take a breath. I'm gonna get some water. And that finishes up the uh, elk survival part of what I wanted to present. And then we're gonna transition into what is this thing called a predator pit? And once we get through with answering that question, I'll talk about can wolves create a predator pit in elk populations? First off, exactly what is this predator pit? Well, you can Google it. You can Google wolf predator pit. And at about a half a second, you get like, what is that? Almost 4 million results. Um, I will just say that what's popularly, some, some of the things that you will hear about predator pits aren't exactly what we consider a predator pit in the wildlife profession. And so the first thing I wanted to do was talk about what do we consider a, a predator pit in the wildlife profession because it's not exactly what you might hear if you do a Google search. So to explain what we mean by a predator pit in the wildlife profession, first have to talk about elk population growth <coughs> in the absence of any predation. And so what I have here is a plot uh, that shows the growth rate of the elk population at different elk densities. So you can imagine if there's not very many elk out there, down around zero, sort of like Idaho at the turn of the century, right? And so there's not a lot of elk out there. There's great habitat and there's no predation. This is kind of like the Shangri-La. So your growth rate is really high. And if the growth rate is above zero, then your population is gonna increase. If it's below zero, it's going to decrease. So again, if your growth rate is above zero, you're gonna increase. So anywhere in this range of an elk density, the population is gonna increase. But then what happens if you get too big, if you get too many elk out there? Well, then the idea is that they eat all the food. There's nothing left. And so the population is actually gonna decrease if your elk density gets above what the habitat can support. So that population is actually gonna decline. It's gonna decrease. And it sort of settles on this area where the growth rate is zero. So you're gonna grow up to that, but if you get too high, you're gonna grow down to it. You go below it a little, you grow back up. And that's what we call the carrying capacity of the habitat. That's where the population likes to settle. It's its happy place. So if we add predation, then we have the red line. And I can't get into all of the mechanisms that uh, go into how that blue line changes shape. I can at the end, if, if there are questions, uh, I can get into that. But at this point, we just need to talk about the red line as if this is what would likely happen when you throw predation onto an ungulate population. So it takes on this interesting shape but again, there's still an area out here where the population likes to settle. It's a little bit less than if there was no predation, but this is not what we're considering a predator pit. Just because you add predation and the population settles at a lower density, that's not really what we consider a predator pit in the wildlife profession. And so brings up the question, what is a predator pit? Well, predator pit occurs when that red line really gets dramatic and starts doing some funky things where it crosses that zero growth line like three times. So if you take a look out here to the right, this is kind of where we were earlier. This is an area where there's positive population growth. So if you're anywhere in this elk density, your population is gonna increase. You go too far, it'll decrease. And so there's still this equilibrium sort of population size 
um, out there to the right where the elk population likes to stabilize. But a predator pit occurs on this left part of the plot. So if you go down to really small population abundances, you still have a, po a positive population growth. And so the population will increase. But if you get in this little valley here, that's a valley of negative population growth. The population is supposed to decline at those densities. And so it actually goes back down one. So you have this other place where the population likes to settle. This is the classic predator pit where you have two stars. You have two sort of happy places for the elk population to settle into. And you can imagine this is a very interesting dynamic and very in, of a lot of interest to managers. What if you're stuck down here at this bottom one, at this lower sort of equilibrium, and you just can't get out of it? Well, for a manager, they would say, well, let's just release the effect of predation for a little while. The population will grow up to a higher density, and we can end up at a higher ungulate abundance. And also we can put the predators back in and it'll just stay there. So you can have the best of both worlds. So that's why it's of great interest to managers. Now, is this reality? Is this actually something that happens out there? Well, if you put in realistic parameters for elk and wolves, you don't get that really crazy red line shape. You get this one where there's not really a predator pit. So it's not predicted to have a predator pit for elk and wolves when you put in realistic parameters. Okay. But there's one thing that was missing here. And this is something that I got interested in. And it was mainly by looking at some of the survival data that we had in, in Idaho. And what we found there was that in certain years, basically when the snow was really deep, the predation rate by wolves increased dramatically on elk. And so, and then you would have other years where the snow wasn't very deep, predation rate by wolves wasn't very high, but the point is that it bounced around a lot. So it wasn't just like this average predation rate that hit them every year it bounced around from year to year. So the question is, does that matter? And that's what I wanted to look at. And that is how does the amount of annual variation in the predation rate affect these predictions? Does it change anything? And then does habitat quality or the carrying capacity matter? This research was published um, what was it, about a year ago in Oikos. So you can take a look at that if you want. So the first thing I want to show is what happens if you have really good habitat and there's not a lot of variation in the predation rate. Well, this plot shows what an elk population is expected to do under that scenario. So you start off with a certain number of elk. And then you have to run a bunch of different like possibilities. Each of those little black squiggly lines is a possibility for what a particular elk population might do um, when there's a high carrying capacity and not much variation in the predation rate. And so as you'll see, the elk populations tend to grow up to where they're supposed to go. Not much going on here. So the next scenario is there's still not very much variation in the predation rate, but now we're, let's say there's low habitat quality. The carrying capacity is pretty low. Does this matter? Again, we can look at lots of different possibilities of what might happen, but in general, not much going on here. The populations tend to be around where they're supposed to be, where they were predicted to be. So what happens if we increase that variation? So now let's look at a scenario where there's high quality habitat, 
a very high carrying capacity, but now there's a lot of variation in the predation rate. So maybe we've got winters that are going berserk. We've got really bad winters where not very much snow and other winters, and it translates into a highly variable predation rate. Well, in this case, some pretty interesting things happen. And that is we can still see a lot of the populations tend to grow up to that higher carrying capacity. But there's also about 13% chance that it's going to dive into a very low equilibrium. This is kind of like what you would expect in a predator pit where you have two places where the population could stabilize. And then lastly, if there's low habitat quality and high variation in the predation rate, well, this is the case where it doesn't look very good for elk um, in this case, because everything eventually seems like it's trending towards a pretty low uh, equilibrium. So question is, can wolves induce a predator pit? Well, it depends. If there's not a lot of variation in the predation rate, we don't really see predator pit dynamics. Populations tend to grow to where they are supposed to be. If there's a lot of variation in that predation rate, it bounces around a lot from year to year. Well, then it depends on what the carrying capacity is. If the habitat is good, it actually can behave like a predator pit. And if the habitat is poor, then all bets are off and things don't look very good. So the predator pit question. The first thing I want to stress is habitat quality matters. It's important. The answer to that question depends on how good the habitat is. It also matters how much variation, how much things bounce around. So we can't just look at average predation rates to see what might happen. Um, the variation matters. And lastly, I'm gonna stress what Diane talked about earlier. Um, when we think about wolves and elk and people included in that equation, it's really a pretty complex system. It's, it's more than just those two. There is a habitat component. There are the elk, there are the wolves. There's also other ungulates out there and other predators. And so where we're at in Idaho is recognizing that there are actually arrows, there are connections between all of these components. And when you do something to one, you could affect the other, which can affect the other, which can affect the other. So it makes it really complex. It makes it very hard to predict what's going to happen. Um, for a person like me, it makes it very exciting. This is a wonderful area for research and um, pretty exciting. Um, but that may be what you're, what you're looking at. I just say enjoy. I enjoy working on these systems and I hope you'll enjoy the complexity uh, that will come your way. Okay, one last sip of water. And we'll go to the last thing I wanted to talk about. And that is, how are the wolves doing in Idaho? And so as part of that elk survival study, I actually needed those estimates of pack sizes to relate to whether or not the risk of mortality increased. And that turned into a whole research project in itself to get statewide estimates of pack sizes that we could associate to each of these elk populations for 12 years. So that was a, that was a pretty significant undertaking in itself. It ended up turning into a research project. Um, and this study was published in the Journal of Wildlife Management uh, a couple of years ago. So what we used was in what's called, we call an integrated population model to get those pack counts across space through time. And I just wanna brief, briefly describe what an integrated population model is. You start with this idea of, of 
you know, how to pack dynamics change. So in this case, we were interested in estimating pack size through time so that we could associate that to the risk of elk mortality. Um, but we recognize that pack size is actually a function of the mortality rate, natural mortality, the harvest rate, the dispersal rate, and recruitment, which is then a function of how many pups are coming in and how much immigration there is. So this is sort of what happens to a pack. And we have various sources of data that we can use to inform each of these processes. So we had, like I said, like 200 wolves that were collared throughout the state, GPS monitoring of those wolves. That information allowed us to estimate things like mortality, harvest rates, dispersal rates. We also were doing pack counts across the state where we go out and fly around in helicopters and, and count the number of, of wolves in a pack, which directly relates to pack size. So we put all of that in, and what's neat about an integrated population model is that your data, GPS monitoring and pack counts, then allow you to look at things like mortality, harvest rates, dispersal, recruitment, pack sizes across time. Okay, so how are they doing? What were the results of that? Oh, oh shoot. Oh, I was going to try not to. Uh, okay, <laughs> hold on. Okay, we're back. I just can't click on a picture. It takes me to the website. All right, how are they doing? Um, well, the dark black line going from left to right is the average pack size through time um, since we started the elk survival study in 2004 and ended it in 2016. Uh, there has been some changes to mean pack size, but not significant ones. And then the gray bars are the number of wolves harvested in the state. Uh, so it started in 2010, and then it was content, and then it took a break in 2011, and then we had harvest from 2012 to 2016. And so you can kind of see how pack size has changed in relation to when wolves um, began being harvested. We're also look at, able to look at the probability of a wolf being harvested in Idaho. Um, and this is the monthly probability, but I've also got the annual, the years on there. And basically what we found was that the probability of harvest has been declining uh, since 2009. Um, it's been on a steady decline. Isn't super surprising. Uh, wolves are pretty smart creatures. Uh, they kind of figure out um, what it is that they do that doesn't, that doesn't bode well for them and they stop doing that. So it's, it's, it, it just gets harder and harder for people interested in harving, harvesting a wolf to actually get it done. We're able to look at wolf recruitment. So how many pups are coming in to these packs on a yearly basis? And in this case, we had to define recruitment as how many pups basically make it to October. So there are about four or five wolves, uh, wolf pups that make it um, to October across the state. And then we were also look, able to look at that in relation to harvest. So there was, was there a difference in recruitment before the period when harvest occurred versus after? And this is just, this plot just shows the likelihood of that mean number recruited in. So that mean number was about four and the distributions there just are supposed to illustrate our uncertainty in that estimate of mean recruitment. The bottom line here is that there wasn't a lot of difference um, pre versus post harvest in the, our estimate of mean recruitment. And then which individuals are getting harvested? So are individuals harvested um, likely to have dispersed? No, 
actually the ones that got harvested weren't necessarily the ones that would have likely become dispersers. Were they likely have to died from something else? No, not really. Um, and so the only thing that's left is were they likely to have remained in the pack? So they would, would they have just kind of hung out in the pack if they hadn't been harvested? And the answer was yes. So what that means is that re harvest has the potential to reduce pack sizes, because if you're harvesting ones that would have remained in the pack, um, then that potentially can reduce pack sizes. I have to stress that it's potential because there's a lot of other things that factor into pack sizes, in particular immigration, how many come in and, and also dispersal, how many go out. So 15 years later, pack sizes have changed a little, but not much, both before and after harvest. The harvest rates have declined. Um, and this is substantiated by, um, you know, hunters reporting, you know, success rates and things like that. So it, it is getting harder and harder. And harvest can potentially affect pack sizes. So that is all I have for my research. Um, I hope I was just about right on time, but I thank you for the opportunity again. There's a ton of people that I wish I could put acknowledgements up here, but just think of almost the entire Idaho fishing game, University of Montana, University of Idaho. There's a lot of people, so. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Thanks for thanks for taking the time. And you can go ahead and stop sharing your screen. And, and Diane, you can turn your camera back on. Thank you. Great presentations and, and thanks a lot. We've we've maintained a, a really strong audience here of just about 400 people for the last hour and a half. So uh, lots of good interest and, and lots of good points in there. And you, you guys talk a lot about uh, wolves and, and how they're managed now. And, and we're in a very different world right now in, in Colorado where we're looking at the reintroduction and, and the initial stages. So many of the, the kinds of topics that you talk about are things that we need to think about down the line. But right now we're we're in this very uh, very small population, very you know very beginning of where we will be, where you guys are now, 20 years, 25 years after reintroduction. A couple of questions that, that have come in from from commissioners, and Diane, this is specific to you. And and looking at the the livestock depredation slide that you had up with the, the number of wolves. Uh, I believe there's a number of wolf packs, so the number of wolves and the, the amount of cattle and, and sheep predation. And the question was about um, what was done to reduce sheep predations, sheep predation levels below to below, sorry, what was done to reduce sheep depredation to levels below cattle since 2010? How come there's a, a difference in there um, in the amounts of, of depredation between those two types of livestock? That's a good question. I think the fact is one sheep outfit got hit really hard one year. That spike went up really steeply and came down where cattle is more level. Um, I, I think that's the reason. And I mean, when wolves get into a, well, well bears too. I know a grizzly bear got in and killed 55 sheep one night. I mean, when predators get into a place where there's a lot of sheep gathered, the mortality numbers are extraordinarily high. Thank you. So John, in, in your description of, of mortality rates and, and for calves and, and cow elk, so given the impacts that, that snow depth and the, the fact that a smaller calf shows a higher mortality, what's your view on whether wolf predation is compensatory or additive? And, and maybe you could describe what those terms are, compensatory mortality and additive mortality. And similarly, what about lion predation? Are those viewed as compensatory or additive to the elk survival? Yeah, so briefly, um, the idea of compensatory mortality is that one cause of death is, is going to kill an individual that would have otherwise died from something else. So the classic idea behind compensatory mortality is when we hunt game birds. We hunt them in the fall, we kill a lot of game birds, 
but a lot of those would have died over winter anyway. anyway. And so we really don't change the population that much by hunting a lot of game birds in the fall. Um, that's the idea of compensatory mortality. Additive mortality is when something dies from one cause and it wasn't going to die from anything else for a while. Those concepts are really tough because as you can imagine already, they depend on the time scale that you look forward in. Everything is gonna die eventually of something. And so the idea of, of additive and compensatory mortality is a good one. It's one that is important, but it is also a very difficult one um, uh, to talk about. And I, so I don't wanna dodge the question, but I just wanted to, to get that out there that it, it, it's not super straightforward um, when you go, when you talk about additive versus compensatory, okay? Um, now, going back to the question of sort of were our wolves and mountain lion predation and is it additive versus compensatory? We didn't find a lot of our elk dying from malnutrition. Um, even in, you know, so it, it's, Not to say that some of those that were killed by mountain lions or wolves wouldn't have died of malnutrition, but we had a lot of spatial variation in the elk that we monitored. And so some of those elk lived in areas where there were no elk, where there were no wolves. So those weren't dying of malnutrition. So there's that. I will say that it's interesting that wolves tended to select older cows and smaller calves. So if there is a potential for some compensatory mortality going on, that it's probably more likely to be with wolves than with mountain lions that essentially took everything in equal proportion to what was available. It's a, it's a great question, to be super honest with you. We should probably, that's, that's, that's a future research project. I thank you for the idea. <laughs> hey, another, another question for you, John, that, that's coming. Is there evidence of increased lion predation due to wolves stealing lion kills? And if so, is there a correlation with larger pack sizes increasing that dynamic? That is a research question that would be incredibly difficult to answer. Um, that is one that, you know, you could, you could think through logically why that makes sense, um, but we have no data to support that either way. And that type of research is actually one that would be, it would be pretty intensive. And, and no, I, to my knowledge, no one has taken that on at a scale that would be necessary to make generalizations about that. And, and just a, a clarifying question too, in, in the, the elk survival study, did you maintain 200 wolves collared for that entire 12 years of, of that study? No, I, and the elk came on and off. That was the total number by the end of the study. So in any one particular year, there were not 200 wolves collared. Uh, we tried to keep collars in each of the packs that were in Idaho because that's how we were monitoring them. We would put a collar on a, an individual and then they would go out and fly and try to count the number of pack members. That's how we tried to keep uh, an idea of the, the abundance of wolves in Idaho uh, for um, uh, the recovery criteria. Um, but no, in any one particular year, there was not 200 wolves with um, collars on them. Thank you. Diane, we're intrigued by one of the comments that you made about the, the status of wolves in, in Montana, and, and you described the species in need of special management. And, and also curious to hear from both of your perspectives, from both Idaho and, and Montana's perspective, 
looking back as to when wolves were initially reintroduced and, and the use of the 10J, the experimental non-essential status and, and what that meant and, and how that was implemented in, in your states. Of course, now wolves are delisted in, in the Northern Rocky states. And so that's, that's not relevant, but it is something that, that's being considered within Colorado as to how, what, you know, how these different statuses uh, pertain to management opportunities. Any comments on that? First from Diane. Well, the wolves weren't reintroduced to Montana to start with. They walked down here. Uh, but the wolves that were down in the below I-90, those were included eventually in the non-essential experimental status, even though they arrived by walking down there. But they basically made that the dividing line. And yeah, they were managed with more flexibility with the, the 10J rule, the non-essential experimental, um, whereas the wolves above that line were treated as a fully endangered species. And it, that, it, that affected how depredations were handled, if lethal control was used, non-lethal. Um, and then eventually the line just went away. <laughs> but those are things you'll have to definitely think about in Colorado, how you're going to do it. John, how about you? Any, any comment on the status? I don't have a lot. All I can say is that Looking at our wolf our wolf packs and all of the data that we had from the GPS collared wolves and pack sizes before and after, um, it appears like there wasn't a whole lot of change in anything. Like they just kept doing their thing, no matter what status we threw at them they just sort of just kept doing their thing. Um, they found places to live, they found ways to avoid um, dying from whatever cause that is, they found ways to reproduce. Um, so just at a super 10,000 foot level across the state of Idaho, um, from a population perspective of wolves, you just don't see a huge difference in, I don't think many of them really cared what they were classed, you know, they, they, the population itself didn't really recognize when these classifications change through time. I would just, I would just add on to that, that wolves are so resilient. They're, they're really resilient. As you know, John, I agree. I agree with everything you've said and that if a pack if a pack is removed for depredating livestock, within a year, there's more wolves back. And then the idea is that hopefully the wolves that have replaced the depredators are non-depredators, but they're always shuffling. Their wolves will find an empty niche and they will fill it. Do you agree with that? I do. A question's come in about the idea of, of trophic cascades, and, and I, I think it was you, Diane, that, that mentioned that briefly about, about the idea. Do you think it's feasible to have enough wolves functioning at an ecological level to, to implement or influence uh, trophic cascades, trophic influences on the statewide scale or the West Slope scale of, of Western Colorado? I would say there's so much variation in habitat and ecotones and predator cohorts and multiple species or not. I, I just, you can't say anything over a huge region. And even where they've studied trophic cascades, they look at a small segment of the population. And some of those are resulted from top down, some from bottom up. Their arguments go on and on. So I don't think you can make a blanket statement, no. John, do you have a, a comment about that? I do, and, the, and the, maybe, and I think this is, is part of why you see so much variation in, in those arguments about uh, whether or not trophic cascades have occurred, are occurring, and whether it's wolves or, or something else that's going on. And that is that these are like, these are ecological systems that don't change overnight. Right? And whatever we're seeing now is not what we're gonna see five years from now or 10 years from now. And I think part of the, the 
thing that we need to be careful with with trophic cascades is that is really a question that should be looked at on a decadal sort of time scale. We're trying to force it into, let's answer it right now. Um, but the whole idea behind trophic cascades is a behavioral one. And so you have to allow these long lived animals, elk and wolves, time to change behavior and then change them back. So, so that's the only thing I would say is that um, for, for me, and I'm not into all of the arguments for and against or whether or not trophic cascades are going on. Um, but for me, that's where I'm at. I'm just at a, at a level of let's just wait and see and, and maybe address this at a later date. <laughs> Both the statements that, that you've made, John, about, about you know, the complexities of, of predation on, from wolves on ungular populations and, and this topic too, trophic cascade, it's difficult to make generalization kinds of comments, right? It's, it, there, there are many variables that are at play with that. A question that's come in, we have a unique opportunity to collar every wolf that's reintroduced into Colorado. You know, as we're beginning our reintroductions, uh, every wolf, there, there's the potential that we could put a collar on, on every wolf. And, and is that advisable from your perspectives? And is, that, is it feasible to have uh, wolf collars on all wolves once they start reproducing and, and going into dens and, and collaring pups and so on? Comments on that? Who do you want to answer that? <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll start. I'll start. It's possible for a little while. It takes a huge effort. It takes an enormous effort. That's sort of the what we tried to do for the longest time um, to meet recovery goals is we would collar wolves. Every pack that was out there needed a collar so that we could go out in the wintertime find that wolf and then count how many were in that pack. Um, that works for a while. And what eventually happens is it gets to a point where it just is too hard to do anymore. But that's what you're used to doing. And that's how you're used to monitoring the wolf population. And so suddenly when you can't do that anymore, then everything that everybody has gotten used to is no longer available and you have to bring something new on them. And Diane maybe can talk to whether or not, you know, how acceptable that is. Uh, but it is something that, yes, you can do it for a while at a lot of cost. That's all, I saw. That's all I've seen. I would say when you first bring wolves in, yes, you can collar every wolf. And I've I've been trapping and collaring wolves for 40 years and it's extremely challenging. But at some point, I have to beg the question, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? Why can't they just live out on the landscape like another wild animal? Because you develop the expectation with the public that every wolf is gonna be radio collared and we'll be able to tell you where everyone is all the time. And eventually that's not gonna be a reality. And you know, in Yellowstone, they collar, I think, about a third of the wolves, something like that. And because they're a pack animal, you can collar a couple of animals in a pack and you can keep track on the bigger group. So I guess I would ask the objective of collaring them because you create a false expectation with the public. And I don't think that should be set out there. I've experienced that with the ranchers when they put a GPS collar on a wolf. They want to know, will you call me? As soon as you know the wolf is near my place, well, the data is delayed by, you know, the satellite transmissions and it's two days or a day off or whatever. And, and I said, I'm sorry, I, I can't because it's not, it's not possible, but there's that expectation created because they perceived with the benefit of a GPS collar that we could do that. So I'm just saying, be careful what you promise the public. Great, thank you for that. Good, good insightful answers. Diane, this may be more directed to you, especially relative to, to one of the slides that you put up. From, from what you've learned in, in all of your wolf work, can you give any advice on a choice of a location for the release, where we might eventually release wolves? And if, it, if, if it's clear that they are likely to move you know, with, with, a high, with, with the expectation that wolves are, are not going to stay precisely where the cages are open or where they're released, what kind of considerations should be given to where those 
releases happen? I think the most critical thing for wolves, there's two things, is they have to have adequate to winter range where there's prey. So they have to, where you're gonna release them has gotta incorporate elk or deer winter range. And they have to have habitat where they can den in security. And other than that, wolves tend to look for habitat like where they came from. <laughs> so I also suggest, recommend holding them in pens. I would, tr I would try and mimic what they did in Yellowstone because that worked pretty well in terms of keeping them in an area. But you got to remember, they're, they're going to travel. But when they released them in Yellowstone, they held them over through the breeding season and they let them out just before the females were going to whelp. So they couldn't go very far because she had to dig it down and have her pups. And they didn't know that would work so well, but it did. And in Idaho, when they did the hard release, they took younger animals that were not packs and they just put them out and they, they blew around like dandelion fuzz in the wind and found each other and created packs eventually. So both methods worked. So you kind of have to think about what your objectives are. Yeah, and there, there's lots of logistics associated with either of those those techniques too. And, and we are yes. gonna, I should say too, we are gonna have, this is just the first in, in three sessions and we've gotten a few comments about uh, another session would be valuable to talk about the reintroduction. We will have that yes. topic and, and have some of the experts that were involved in, in both the Yellowstone and the Central Idaho uh, project at a, at a future education session. So, so thank you for that. So the other thing is wolves don't live up in the mountains in the rock and ice because there's nothing to eat there in the winter. They have to have part of the range in the lowlands where the animals are in the winter time. That's just something to keep important. They don't live in rock and ice in the Rocky Mountain parks. That's, it might be part of the range, but that's not where they're going to be living. John, any, any insight from you as to, to release locations? No, no, not beyond what Diane said. Thanks. A question for, for either of you, for both of you, I think. Do you think that wolves can influence the extent and magnitude of chronic wasting disease? No. That was simple. Diane, do you have anything to add to that? The jury's out. The science I've read on it, I've seen it both ways. And I don't think we've had enough chronic wasting disease around for long enough. But if you look in the Midwest, they got chronic wasting disease there for 30 years and they got a lot of wolves. So I, I'm not going to predict. Okay. Fair enough. We, we hear a lot about the, the economic boon that, that wolves have on wildlife viewing in Yellowstone and, and it was brought up about Gardner and in those areas. Are there areas in, in your states aside outside of the Yellowstone, greater Yellowstone ecosystem, are there other places in Idaho or Montana that people could reliably go and, and see wolves? And are, are there measurable economic impacts to those communities, if, the, if those communities exist? John, you wanna go first or you want me to? I'll go first, because mine's really short. Not that I know of. I don't know of anywhere where wolves uh, are outside of Yellowstone. And, and there's a portion of Yellowstone in Idaho, so we can go there, but in the other 99.9% .9 of Idaho, Thanks. I am definitely not aware of an area where you can go and just watch wolves do their thing. Yeah, and I would agree with that in Montana because Yellowstone is the perfect combination of protected landscape that is open and vast and has huge amounts of volunteers and technicians and people with radios and the wolves are colored. If you go there any two days, you will see wolves if you just get up early and stay up late. I mean, that's what I found. And so it's very different from anywhere else I've ever been. Great. See if we have anything, anything less here. Um, I think with that, oh, one, one, oh, that was, that was addressed. Thank you. I think with that, we're, we're ready to, to close this up. John and Diane, thank you very, very much for the, the time that you spent with us tonight and the time that you spent to, to put your presentations together. And, and as I said, we've got two more, at least two more sessions, two more sessions in this education session. The first, the next one will be May 20th. Uh, the registration for that webinar and, and the topic of that will be the reintroduction logistics and, and what uh, went into consideration in the, in the early in the early into mid 90s when the reintroduction was actually implemented in, in Yellowstone and Central Idaho. So that uh, webinar will be on May 20th. Just like this webinar, we will put out press, 
press releases for that. We'll make that link available on the CPW Wolf Management website, or if you just go to the main CPW site, you can search for Wolves Stay Informed or Wolf Management, you'll, you'll be able to find that information there. Uh, and then the third presentation will be on livestock conflicts, livestock depredation, conflict avoidance kinds of issues as well. And, and a date is still to be determined on that. Uh, likely into June is, is when that webinar will be, but we don't have a precise date on that. So with that, a big thank you to our speakers, to John and Diane, also to the numerous CPW staff that have been working behind the scenes with the technology and the questions and, and all of the interaction into those that set up this webinar. Thanks very much. We look forward to speaking with you all in May on the, on the 20th and uh, hope to see you then. And with that, we'll say good night. Thank you very much.